you know, the mangrave is, you know, obviously it's sort of a play on, 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 a, on the, that, that cliche of the man cave, but it's, and it is, I guess, about burying parts of myself that I, I feel done with, but it's also a little bit about digging up too and discovering, you know, and like parts of myself that were buried a long time ago. So I, I kind of think of that title in, in a number of ways that I hope are useful for, um, you know, for understanding it. So. I just had this image of you digging up this little boy, like covered in like dirt oh. and being like, hi. Hey, how's it going? I'm yeah. excited myself that I have ignored for a long time. Yeah. yeah, this is the first poem in the book. It's called Head First. Just a boy then, I was struck hard by a car and arced over the roadside. Despite the pain, I told no one how the man driving kept on driving. I hadn't yet found out about the body or velocity or what a wound is and how some bruises flower spread like steam on the mirror, blurring all beauty. My mother says the eighties were terribly rapey. She hisses into her rotary phone, says a man may leave his voice inside of a stranger forever, place something hard as a blood flecked stone. When I woke in the road, I rested my little chrome bicycle by the curb. The smell of lilac, the sound of traffic starting up again in the street. Shapes that keep us awake decades later. The fuck do I know about all this thickness? Not the slant rhyme of fear and underwear. Haven't I walked around with a killer's power, swaggering until now? But any boy's teen years, days spent pursuant to puberty, the body as factory. I would have driven high across this enormous darkness just to watch a woman unbutton air. I should be writing this with fear, knowing I was danger. I was, when I was 12, I was hit by this car and it was awful. And, um, and uh, I didn't tell anyone about it. I told nobody because I was just, I don't know, I was like ashamed or I didn't want to share that. And, you know, just thinking about like that move, you know, of like, yeah, this terrible thing happened and I don't want to talk about it with anyone. It's just kind of where, <laughs> it's kind of where I get some of the thinking about, you know, the problem with, with you know, the, the dominant strain of masculinity. But, but, you know, I don't want to get too stuck on that 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 aspect because obviously the poem is 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 hoping hopefully trying to bridge to somewhere else, and that is really I think I hope really about trying to empathize a little more with. You know, I'm trying to imagine like what it would be like, you know, for a woman to to have to deal with like uh, misogyny or rape or something like being hit and run like that. You know, being struck like that and um, that's the the sort of the bridge I'm just trying to cross a little bit with the poem, you know, uh, you know, being hit and left there, you know, that that to me um, was the closest I had to try to understand what that kind of horrific experience would be like, you know, and and thinking back to that to that time, but then also that that realization at the end of just like wow, gosh, you know, I. I'm, I'm older now and I'm thinking back of like, of being, you know, uh, like a, a young man and then a man and having relationships and, you know, being in college and doing all this stuff and, and then realizing just like how much power I had in all those moments that it just kind of occurred to me, you know, like how, you know, when it finally occurred to me, like how, how dangerous I really, I could be to somebody or could have been, you know, like, that was a profound realization and one that most people would be like, all right, you know, obviously, but you know, I had to have that realization and try to understand like, wow, you know, like I, I had all these moments, all these experiences and, and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, I'm trying to understand how, how women feel in that, in that, in those, you know, in those moments when there is that danger, you know, like, you know, that, that, 
that often quoted passage of, you know, like men are afraid that women are going to laugh at them and women are afraid that men are going to kill them. Right. Like just sort of digesting that and realizing like, yeah, I never understood. I never realized that I, I knew my part. I was afraid of being laughed at, but I never could empathize with the other part until I got old enough to understand it. Is there anything that you would have done differently? Like when you look back at college and you recognize the moments of power you had, is there any particular moment that stands out that you're like, oh, I wish I had handled it this way? Oh gosh. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, just a lot, just a lot more communication and conversation. I mean, I think there's just like, you know, that, that was just always my weakest, you know, I, I, having grown up in a family that didn't really talk about feelings or emotions or any of that, you know, um, I just, I just had no language for like, uh, for love or for sex or for any of that stuff. I mean, I just had no, um, no ability to kind of communicate about it and so therefore like you know women had to teach me how which is which is awful because it's not their job <laughs> you know and and so like I just benefited from that sort of emotional labor like just over and over again and still do of course you know but but at least I know better a little bit now but um but we're not all we're not all on that journey of like a trying to find the parts of ourselves that are lost, you know? I mean, I think, you know, I, I kind of have this idea or theory about this sort of original wound, right? And for me, it's like, uh, you know, there comes a point as a boy when, you know, we stop wanting to hold hands with our mother, you know, and, and, this, and, and I'll just say, I'm generalizing, obviously, you know, I'm talking about like dominant strain of hetero masculinity as it's sort of handed down, right? So it's, you know, hashtag not all men kind of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, and, and I, and listen, I've been, and I've been through that ringer. Like I have been, you know, I, I, I'll save that for another time, but, I, but okay. there's, <laughs> there's this kind of wound that I, I remember. And it was like, uh, there come, there come in this moment when we stop wanting to hold hands with our moms and there, and there's a conflict about it. Like, we suddenly are getting this signal, right? Like that's not cool or we don't want to do that. And so then we kind of, there's like boy culture over here that's kind of calling us over, you know? And, and so we do, we, we do stop that activity. We do kind of break away from our mothers and we kind of go over there. And when you go over there, boy culture is like, hey, this is cool. Like we don't have to talk about stuff. We don't have to deal with things. Like let's just hang out and, and then we cross over there and a lot of us, you know, um, we never go back to that original break or we never understand that. And it just sort of, we, instead we just kind of feel a kind of shame and we just sort of pile it all on that. And, and what I understand it is, how I understand it is that we need to kind of go back to that moment as men and sort of figure out like what we tossed away when we sort of started rejecting the feminine in that moment because if we're not careful we just build on that and that's where I think like misogyny kind of comes from I think it it can come from that sort of rejection and that that shadow that shame um that happened so early for a lot of us as boys where we just like start rejecting the feminine because we just think that's where we need to go and and so we close off all that part of ourselves and then a lot of us just never go back to it. You know, we never do. And if we could, uh, we could open up and find a whole parts of ourselves that we could enjoy, you know, but we just don't. So as for this poem, um, crawling back, you know, it, it, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just read it first. Okay. Um, crawling back, thick sycamores hold up the sky as I fast walk across the avenue and before I know what's real, a pickup drives by and a man with his face in the window slit as if someone expelling smoke yells out, faggot. The hubcaps of his crew cab truck spin the daylight round. The jogger 10 sidewalk squares ahead maintains his stride and I wonder which one of us is the faggot. 
There are a million soldier ants spilling out of the sidewalk crack to walk the unbroken chain of pheromones. I watch my step. Don't we grow cruel if we're not careful? I spot the feral tuxedo cat who once a week visits our yard to taunt my indoor tom at the glass back door. I watch a giant frown of a cloud dissolve over downtown. How easy to let that red word fall in the road behind me like the boorish little boy I used to be when my body was just one of many theories floating over the fifth grade schoolyard where we all so commonly called each other fag that if you said it loud, every boy standing on the playground would turn his head around. We didn't understand what we were saying first, first of all, you know, when we, when we said that, but you know, I, I certainly didn't. I mean, I had all these like homosexual uncle, like uncles and like people in my, you know, and like, and meanwhile- Wait, I just, what do you mean all these homosexual uncles? How many homosexual uncles did you have? I had like two or three, I think. Okay. And, um, you just you know, made it sound like you had 10. Yeah, well, like, I mean, I had, I had like, <laughs> I had people in my life, you know, that were, that were, that, that I could have understood if I had, if I had been able or respected if I had known better or, um, and it wasn't like I didn't, you know, it's, it wasn't, it wasn't like I understood, you know, what I was doing as a, as, as a boy saying that, but, but, but it was just still awful and horrific and, and insulting and, and, and shameful that, that kind of behavior, you know, that sort of culture, you know, it was, uh, you know, I grew up in, in like a sort of working class sports culture, uh, New Jersey, 1980s, you know, like everybody, it was just the language we used. It was, it was just brutal, you know, and the, and the, the, the way we treated each other and the violence and the misogyny and the, and yeah, and the rape culture. I mean, it was all there. Um, and the homophobia. I mean, the home it was also the rise of, you know, AIDS and there yeah. was so much yeah. stigma and that isn't there today. And kids yeah. today understand there's a sexual spectrum and understand there's gender mm. expression right. options. Right. Like we didn't have any of that, you know. And the whole world's watching now, like everything, you, you know, like there's no, there was no, like, no one shamed you for doing that. Like no one, I, I was just, it was such a lost time. Uh, but when you did say that word or when boys said it to each other or men said it to boys or whatever, and you said you didn't quite understand, but did you understand that that meant homosexual? Like, did you understand what the word yeah. was? So did you remember having a negative connotation? You know, you were talking about rejection, rejecting the feminine mm -hmm. and often homosexuality is considered feminine, even though it's not, and you can be super masculine and gay, but there's that kind of, um, you know, connotation. So do you think it was a further extension of that rejection? I do, and I think it was like for boys, and it was like let's get together and sort of bond over being this and othering that. You know, like I think it was a safe place, like to to be speaking that way, because there were times, honestly, when it was like a term of endearment for a friend, for a guy. Like, really, I have to tell you that that there was it was like I mean it was like. showing up at a party as like a 15 year old kid and like tackling your best friend to the ground, you know, it was like love language, you know, like <laughs> punching, a, punching a guy and a, punching another guy or like insulting him. It was like, it was this, this really like uh, sort of Neanderthal way of, of like reaching out. <laughs> I, I kind of, I can't really articulate that, that sliver of it, but that's just a sliver of it. Mostly it was just, homophobia and just right. you know, perpetuating just awfulness but but among some friends like they they used it almost like a you know like a greeting you know it's just and this went on for a long time um this went on even into college uh I can remember uh you know even into like well into the 90s where you know guys around you were like you know talking to each other, people who were clearly straight, heterosexual people, 
other heterosexual people like just sort of greeting each other that way you know right. I remember um and now I just watched Fuckboy Island on HBO which was that. so atrocious like I kind of want to write about it but uh -huh. the worst thing you can call each other the men kept calling each other bitch and huh. I feel like that's a similar kind of feminizing mm -hmm. um, that can happen. Yeah. So yeah, still happening. Just there are different words and ways of communicating yeah. it. Yeah, which I think has to go. Mm -hmm. So when you later in life had the realization of your power as a man, did you have a moment when you realized? that kind of homophobia and how pervasive it was? Like, did you have a moment when you were like, oh my God, that's so fucked up? I mean, obviously you wrote this poem. Um, so I'm just wondering if there was a particular moment that stands out to you. Um, yeah, just beginning to sort of, you know, when you, when you finally like love someone who is other, you know, as a friend or, or, or as a relative in my case, like when you finally kind of come into that, love and understanding of that person and who they are and their identity and their experience and you begin to like the empathy starts to flow and you start to then you're just like oh wow like I was awful you know like or that was awful and I you know it's finally like it's finally reached you know it's finally like echoed back to me you know because I've I've got you know, I mean, I talk about this with my students, like we're, we're doing this unit on em like empathy and literature and we're looking at different stories and looking at characters who sort of grow in their empathy and kind of comparing them for it. And, you know, it's, you know, and I talked to them a little bit about empathy. I was just sort of like, how far did your empathy extend? You know, like, does it end at your driveway? Is it people in your family? Is it people in your town? Is it people like earthquake victims? Like, where does it go for, you know, how is it for you? Like, how, how strong is your signal? Like, where does it... And I think for some of us, it really does like, maybe we're just thick enough that we need to like, actually know someone or love someone who has, you know, a different experience than ours for it to like really hit home that maybe our behavior was awful, you know? And I, and I, I guess that's probably what happened for me um, because I, I know I didn't, I, I know what I was participating in was not like, I wasn't, emphatic you know I, I think as like a 12 year old kid I wasn't like emphatically you know out to hunt homosexuals or something like as like a oh. you know when I when I was participating with this culture like it was really just kind of being part of that culture it wasn't it wasn't like wanting to be part of it it was just like this is where I'm at and this is how it plays and so uh, to the extent that I was there I think um just awful but also I don't remember ever really being conscious of like what I was participating in. Right. Kind of, you know. Were you aware of your own feminine? You know, you're talking about excavating and bringing things back up and reconnecting and yeah. returning to that wound. Mm -hmm. um, what has been your relationship to the feminine? Um, yeah, I think, um, well, I think discovering, you know, discovering discovering literature and poetry and writing you know I mean I like I said I grew up in a in like a sports you know I played like six years of football and you know I played baseball and everything and um you know I didn't grow up with like books in my house and you know I was the first person to go to college in my family and it was a male like it was it was a culture of like you know there like more men in my family like I, have mug shots than college degrees you know like it's not it's not oh, oh. Uh, it's not the kind of uh environment that was um embracing the, the, the feminine in any way and except for like as a kind of extreme difference from the masculine you know there wasn't like we didn't share in the in the middle anywhere so anyway i i think when i found um breaking out of that you know, by discovering, you know, a love of, of, of writing and, you know, somewhere in high school, you know, like between after football practice, like writing little poems or, um, you know, do, you know, moving in that direction um, was kind of a way, a place where I could go that was different. And it was kind of a place where some of 
feeling started to grow because you know I, I, I've been teaching young men how to write poems for 20 years basically and I and and in their writing of those poems come their feelings you know and their emotions a lot of times and and I got the, I get the feeling that that that's not a usual occurrence for a lot of them and I was that same way so I think that 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 channeling emotions out was was probably where I started to kind of expand my sense of self in that way, like beyond just the sort of masculine uh, ideal or whatever. Um, and what what made that feel like safe or okay or cool to you? Well, <laughs> all right, this is kind of, uh, this is kind of a weird thing, but I think, so <laughs> culturally, so when I was like 15 or something, my dad took me to, uh, to the Grateful Dead concert. Okay. <laughs> and, then, um, and, and there I sort of like really um, found this like culture that, uh, that just felt, <laughs> that just, just felt like, like this other land uh, culturally that I had come from or been in, right? And so, so, you were like, who are these people? <laughs> yeah, and wow, look how expansive their consciousness is and look how open they are and look how free everyone is and look how everyone has, you know, uh, you know, these open minds. And anyway, I, I proceeded to go back like 30 something times to that experience and was culturally like pretty immersed in it for a while. And, uh, and honestly, that was just like, kind of saved my life because the values that I found in that culture were just really beautiful, like, and very feminine values. You Can know, you tell me what those were to you? What were those values? Um, um, there was a, just a sense of like emotional openness and kindness and, uh, you know, brotherhood and sisterhood and just sort of, um, uh, a sense of like respect for for nature and love and, and just a lot of like you know post 60s kind of even though some of it was very stereotypical it, um things could have gone a very different direction for me had I not like found a home there and uh I I really credit that experience for the that those like six or seven years of being like really immersed in that culture of really like really helped make me you know who I am because because there was just there was just a lot of really positive corrections for me in there in that because even if people were full of shit in that like in that world like even if they were they were even if they were faking any of it it was still better than what people would fake elsewhere you know like uh it was still positive it still had really nice like you know um uh, uh, you know, kind of just the landscape of it was just, just felt positive. Warm, warm and inclusive, right? Yeah, yes. And, um, and so, you know, as, as a person in that culture, I kind of, I think I did really sort of embrace a more feminine part of myself. You know, I had like long hair and I was part of like a culture that was kind of different and could explore things on like a different terms. And it was just, I don't know. So, Wait, so your say, dad took you. So I find that interesting because you're saying that the culture of men in your world and life and family yeah. was very masculine. And that, as you said, there are more mug shots than college degrees, but he was the one to take you. So I'm curious his relationship to it and how that like changed your relationship to him or did it not or? No, because it was really a one-off for him. Uh, Cause he, you know, he had a bunch of buddies like who he went with and I just went. And then for me, it was like, okay, this is where I'm going to be for the next wherever, as long as this goes, you know, but it was just a one-off for him. Okay. Uh, but for me, it was like, it was like this huge door that opened and um, I just found a way to get out of where I was, you know, it was like, how did he react to you after that? How did your family react to you after that? Um, so like, 
I think when my first book of poems came out, like I think my dad like asked my mom if I was gay because of that. Like it, it was very, I mean, so my family's like kind of like uh, sort of like post-immigrant kind of um, a couple generations moved very uh, small town, you know, uh, ethnic kind of families that, and- um, What were, ethnicity? Well, so my, my, my father's family was all Italian and my mother's family was all Polish. And, um, and, and, and that only matters just because it was, I felt the kind of insul insular sometimes. And uh, not a lot of stuff from the outside really got in, you know, in that way. And because there was no like college and not much travel in that way, it was like for family, it, they, they, they were all very like hometown kind of people, small town, you know, you go to the Italian bakery, you go home, you go here, you go to the butcher, like it was all, you know. Go back home. Yeah, like <laughs> you know, my other grandparents are like speaking Polish, like in the stores in their town, it was like all Polish people, it was all Italian people. It was like, I don't know, it was, it, it wasn't, um, so the, you know, and it was like working class pretty much. And it was just, and so it didn't, it, it didn't have like uh, a lot, there, weren't, there wasn't a lot coming in. You know, and so um, I sort of had to, to get out of it to really like, and then once I did, I was just like gone, you know, like I left and then I still, I'm, I guess I'm still gone. I don't know. But uh, anyway. Meaning so, you never return? Like, well, um, I never really lived in the town with my family again after that, you know, whereas all they all just like, they were all like lifers, you know, I mean, like you stay here forever kind of thing, you know. Uh, pretty much and I went off to college so and then I was just like that was it you know once I once I once I saw like that there were all these other roads I just kind of anyway so yes yeah, so because kind of a quite a divide between my family and and me uh, right and the cost of opening up parts of yourself that aren't accepted in your community or culture yeah. right yeah that it has to somehow be like, oh, I'm out, right? Like I'm over here and I'm not there. So that is that hard for you to feel like you're kind of on your own? Yes, and I very much am. Uh, yeah, it's heartbreaking, really. If there is something that you would like someone to take away from reading your book of poems, whether it be a man or a woman or someone who doesn't define themselves in that kind of binary, um, what would you want that to be? I would say that the, that the work is worth it, you know, and, and it is lifelong and I'm not even like halfway through, you know, um, but I know that you can make progress, you know, on, on sort of ridding yourself of some of these preconceptions, some of this script, and some of what sort of manliness culture has done to you, you know, and, and it's and it's done it to, and it hurts men as much, not as much, it hurts men as well as women. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's so much we're not enjoying as men because of it, because of what we've, what we've bought into, uh, whether consciously or not, whether we're someone driving that train or, or just a passenger, like, we're missing out on so much, you know, to to rope these parts of ourselves off that we that we've roped off so long ago, and you got to go back and and you know take those ropes down and see what's there and integrate them back into our lives. <laughs>